Good afternoon, good evening, and good night, depending on where you are in the world. Uh, we are going to be joined in moments by uh, Dr. Bo Branson, um, who is uh, going to discuss with us in some depth um, the question of the Trinity. Um, and so without further ado, I, I bring you uh, Dr. Bo. How are you, sir? Good. How are you doing? I'm well, thank you very much. Uh, I mean, it's always funny. You have these sort of conversations behind the camera and then sort of have to repeat them ever yeah. so slightly <laughs> for the sake of the camera to do the introduction to make it feel natural. Um, I, I'm, yeah, I'm really good. Thank you. As you can see, a lot hairier than yeah, um, the last time right. that you were on. You don't, you don't um, have I mean, to apologize I've, to Orthodox about the facial hair. Well, you see, that's where I'm getting it from. I figure that there's a correlation <laughs> between off wisdom and hairiness. That's it. Exactly. You know, um, I'm going for that. I'm going for that fashion. So, uh, two years ago uh, was the last time wow. that you were here, and we had a, a, a wonderfully in-depth conversation um, on the Trinity, and I, I found it very informative and, and learned a lot from you. Um, and I've, I'm basing actually the structure of today's conversation on that one. So this is literally a build on, on the last time we spoke. Um, but before we start digging into the topic, as you know, it's a, a custom uh, on these on this channel that uh, our guest leads us in a prayer from the Psalms. And so um, without further ado, over to you to, to open us in prayer. Well, I thought I would read this. So this is something that... Uh we actually sing in the orthodox church on uh uh easter sunday or on the saturday uh for the the resurrection uh <clears throat> this is psalm 81 or 82 depending on if you use the septuagint god stood in the assembly of the gods he judges in the midst of the gods saying how long will you judge unjustly and favor the persons of sinners judge the orphan and the poor man Justify a humble and poor man, rescue a poor and needy man, deliver them from the sinner's hand. They do not know nor understand. They carry on in darkness. All the foundations of the earth shall be shaken. I said, ye are gods and all of you sons of the most high. Yet shall ye die like men and like one of the princes you shall fall. Arise, O God, judge the earth, for you shall inherit all the Gentiles. Yes, and um, we Thanks take that as a as a reference to the resurrection. Uh, the word there for arise, O God, is the same the same word as as resurrection. So, all right, um, I know that Trinity. <laughs> it is it is indeed. So, I think I think as I say, I I, I re listened to our entire conversation um, previously, and I want to encourage anyone who watches this to go and watch the first one between mm -hmm. myself and Dr. Bo um, before you watch this one. Like, so stop and go and watch the other one, then come to this one, because this one is going to be building on the last one. And I, I wanted just to start off by exploring um, the relationship between scripture and philosophy, philosophy particularly mm -hmm. with regards to the Trinity. So obviously, you know, the scriptures embody what the church taught and believed. It's a, a, a repository, a depository of its its teachings, its beliefs, its doctrines. Um, and as a, uh, as such, it is a rule of faith in that it is, it's got a canon behind it. 
Um, and it, 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 it portrays, it, it gives this portrait of God as Trinity. But, but what is the relation between that portrait and mm -hmm. the philosophical discourse that then evolved um, right. within the church's discourse about the Trinity over uh, the, the centuries that followed? Yeah, I, I, uh, my view on that um, is all, what you know, Christians, strictly speaking, like what you would think of as Orthodox Christians in the first several centuries and heretics and Gnostics and everybody um, kind of drew on philosophical terminology and ideas to try to explain the biblical faith in a way that people, you know, could understand, educated people from a Hellenistic culture could understand. Um, <clears throat> there's there's kind of a narrative that um, I think a lot of scholars today actually don't really take seriously anymore, but in popular culture, I think it still kind of has this effect that there was this kind of battle between, or there's this dichotomy between sort of a biblical faith and then, and then philosophy. Um, and that that stems from, I think, from Harnack uh, and then ultimately from Hegel. So uh, the, the, you probably have heard the, of the philosopher Hegel and his this kind of simplified version of his philosophy that everything in history is a matter of thesis, antithesis, and then synthesis. So you have like a kind of a worldview that has these internal contradictions in it. And then because of these problems, it kind of gives rise to this sort of op equal and opposite, you know, reaction that also has internal contradictions in it. And then it's only finally, you know, later someone will figure out this way to sort of transcend this, these opposites and, and make sense out of it all. That's where you get things like Marxism is like this, right? Like, you know, you have yeah. economic systems that kind of eventually you get the communist, you know, utopia or whatever. But, but <clears throat> a lot of people were influenced by Hegel and you, you, you find after his philosophy, a lot of people doing this with the Bible itself and with early church history kind of thinking <clears throat> we need to find these like polar opposite things that then like sort of come together. And so you have this story that there was like a this sort of pure Jewish faith that had nothing to do with Greek philosophy and they hated Greeks and everything. And then you have philosophy and Greek pagan thought and it's you know, totally opposite. And then people kind of combine them together. And depending on your point of view, some people think that's great. Hegel thought that's good. Other people like Harnack come along and think that's bad. And uh, I think more people today think that's just not at all accurate. So if you think about it, mm -hmm. um, if you think about it, two out of the 12 disciples had Greek names, <laughs> you know, Greek names have no equivalent in Hebrew. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. And they were brothers. So four out of the 12 disciples came from families like that. Um, uh, Mar ha uh, Hengel, Martin Hangel has a bunch of stuff on this that, you know, you start looking at grave sites in Jerusalem and Israel. A lot of them have Greek inscriptions and this sort of thing. Like, to this day, a lot of Jewish people are named Alexander um, <laughs> out, of, out yeah. of Alexander the Great because they had a lot of respect for Alexander. So anyway, you know, there, there's this, th there was this older view that there's kind of this combat between faith and philosophy or something. And uh, there's some of that in some of the church fathers, but it, others of the church fathers didn't really think that way. Um, Justin Martyr, you know, thought he was, he thought philosophy was good. Basil, I think, St. Basil the Great has, I feel like the best view on this. And there's a short, very short writing. It's kind of a classic called To the Youths, where he uh, he gives the analogy. He says a Christian, a good Christian is like a bee. And he says the bee goes around to all of the different flowers, right? And uh, it doesn't matter what the flowers are. And it finds the nectar that's good. And it takes that and it leaves the rest, right? Mm. Uh, and then it goes back to it, you know, goes back to the beehive with just the good things and and makes its honey and makes the the, the hive and everything. And uh, that was sort of his view is kind of an eclectic view that, you know, yeah, not all of pagan thought obviously is compatible with Christianity, but 
the sort of the wise thing to do is to try to be discerning and think about, you know, what parts are right and what parts are wrong and what parts are useful and, and what parts aren't. And that's a difficult, you know, it takes discernment and, and it's not obvious what to do, but it's, but it's more than just a simplistic sort of, um, let's just take Plato and sort of shoehorn him into the Bible or let's just reject anything that he says. And um, so I think, uh, I think that's the right view. And I think that's kind of the view that most of the church fathers kind of eventually. Say yeah. Take some I think, I think, I, I mean, for me and, and, you know, feel free to, to correct me if you think I'm wrong, but like philosophy took the place of science today. It is yeah, the exactly overarching right. yeah. Yeah. paradigm Mm -hmm. And so if you wanted to communicate any idea today, you right. inevitably end up referencing it through science. Yeah. And in those days, it was philosophy. So it, right. as the church went out into the Gentile world from the Jewish context, it had to start using philosophy to communicate its beliefs right. to people. Yeah, I, you know? I think that's exactly right. I think one example I like to use is like today, you know, if I was going to be talking to someone, a non-Christian about Christianity and about the, you know, the ideas of sin and temptation and how to kind of, you know, change your character, you know, probably at some point I would appeal to the notion of like the subconscious, right? I'd say like, well, such and such just subconsciously might influence. And of course, that's something I'm taking from Freud. Like that's his, mm. his idea, the subconscious. But uh, and there's a lot about Freud that's really wacky and you know and, and not scientific and not Christian. Yeah. But it's stuff that you know that, that's a term that's very useful, right? And people yeah. understand what it means, you know, at least in, in an intuitive or general kind of way. So yeah, it's just useful vocabulary. And that's I think that's exactly I think you're exactly right. Like if you were, if you're talking to people today, you have to talk to them in terms of modern science and modern mm. thought that they can understand to try to kind of explain, you know, yeah. maybe trying to get them back to something different. But and I do, I do, I, I do very much so when we talk about, you know, the Trinity, one being three and three being one, I reference the triple point of water or, three-dimensional space or, or things like that yeah, yeah. Uh, and these are obviously scientific references not philosophical references mm -hmm. um in, so would it be fair to, to sort of use a picture metaphor that might explain um this relationship would it be fair uh, and again you know if you feel that it's flawed uh you know give me a better one but mm -hmm. scripture is like a mosaic painted onto a wall Mm -hmm. And philosophy is like the scaffold that we put in front of the wall so that we can see the different aspects of the picture in more detail. So we can get up close and examine this part of the picture or that part of the picture. Right. Yeah, I think that's not necessarily a bad analogy, I think. I reckon you're going to need to borrow it. <laughs> Maybe. You can, Maybe. by the way. I won't, I won't, use, I won't use copyright. Um, I do think that's right, though, too. I think a lot of the church fathers, you see you know, them using ideas from philosophy or, or rhetoric or just other kind of branches of knowledge to, to try to better understand the scriptures. Yeah. Yeah. So in, in terms of then like, you know, the councils, like the council of Nicaea, the council of Constantinople, what was the significant um, relationship between the councils and philosophy and how the councils used philosophy? Mm -hmm. I think mainly, um, so first of all, I mean, um, you might want to distinguish between sort of different levels, right? So there's things like, you know, the creed that comes out of Nicaea and Constantinople, which is kind of this, you know, official statement. And then, or like the definition at Chalcedon, right? Uh, and then you have things like, you know, the minutes from those councils where people are just kind of debating and arguing and so forth. And it's not like, you know, um, you can't look at that as like, divinely inspired or something like that when it's people arguing right um yeah. but they're using philosophy to to make arguments and to explain ideas right you don't see a ton of philosophy in like you know the creed or the definition of chalcedon some um and you you see more of it i think in the church father's writings where they're trying to sort of explain the idea 
And then, you know, once in a while, you, you might see a few technical terms like in, in a creed or something that have been, um, you know, famously like homo usius, right? The word usia in the creed. Um, I, I did a debate not too long ago with someone about the Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed. And um, I put online, I can give you a link to this if you want, just to, you know, I, I just put like the creed and then verses from the Bible side by side and in Greek and English and just showed like the vast majority of the creed is actually just sentences and things taken from the Bible and kind of put yeah. in order. Um, so, uh, and uh, one thing I will say too, is there's also been this view about the doctrine of the Trinity itself, that it was this Hegelian sort of synthesis from um, like, you know, pagan, polytheism gave, gives rise to Jewish monotheism, but then, you know, finally it's kind of brought together in the doctrine of the Trinity. And um, partly that goes back to Hegel because Hegel liked the doctrine of the Trinity, actually. It's kind of what inspired his thesis, antithesis, synthesis is kind of a Trinitarian thing, but but mm. he thought that the synthesis was good. Like he thought that's a good thing, that the end product is good. Other people who are sort of more conservative or traditionalist, you know, think like, well, no, that's bad. That's, you know, you're combining these two things. But I don't think that that's the case, though. I think it, it, if you actually look at the church fathers uh, who talk about the Trinity early on, um, they they rarely discuss like middle Platonism and this sort of stuff that people have, have thoughts like the culprit for the doctrine of Trinity. They mostly discuss... Um, the Old Testament, really. Um, yeah. Most, most of what they discuss, like if you read St. Justin Martyr's dialogue with Trifo, most of what it's about is just how to correctly interpret the Old Testament. It's not yeah. even based on the New Testament. It's based on the Old Testament. Um, and, and a lot of it, um, I don't know if this is, you know, the, the main thing, but it, it's certainly one of the big issues um, and it really predates Christianity. Um, you, you see this in, in like Jewish apocalyptic literature from the late second temple period um, is just this tension between God tells Moses, no one can see me and live, but then lots of people see God. Right. Hmm. And so you, you have, and then you, and, and the Bible never says there's two different senses in which you can see God. That's how some people try to, portray it but there's there's nothing in the scripture that actually says anything like that um and there's never any time when it says well not literally no one but you know no one who's like not a prophet or something like that um the only time there's one time in the new testament when that there's kind of an exception where jesus says no one has ever seen the father except he who is from god yeah presumably meaning himself right yeah so that doesn't give you any help either. So like, how is, how does Moses and how do Isaiah and Jacob see God? Um, and in the late second temple period, a lot of Jewish uh, thinkers thought, well, there's this other figure in the old Testament that's sometimes called the angel of the Lord, mm -hmm. uh, or sometimes it's called the mm -hmm. word of the Lord. And then sometimes it's called the Lord or God. Right. Yeah. Uh, and so there must be these two different figures and they would uh, sometimes even refer to them as the invisible Yahweh and the visible Yahweh. Or sometimes yeah. they would call it uh, Yahweh Hakadol, big Yahweh and Yahweh Hakatan, little Yahweh, which is actually kind of in Hebrew looks like Yahweh senior and Yahweh junior. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, yeah. But when you get to the New Testament, you see father and son and there's all this insistence that no one has ever seen the father. In fact, the New Testament says it even more, much more frequently than the Old Testament, that no one has ever seen God. Uh, but then there's all this language about, but the Son of God has revealed him, and Christ is the icon of the invisible God, and he's the exact image of his hypostasis and all these kinds of things. Where, and, you know, Jesus says, hey, you know, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, right? Hmm. And that's what you see in all the early church fathers. It's not, it, it's not appealing to, you know, platonism or something like that it's saying well how do we reconcile this that it, it says no one's seen god no one's seen the father but then people have seen god 
But then sometimes this God is called the angel of the Lord and Jesus is the icon of God. I mean, it looks like the idea is that no one has seen God the Father, but all the times in the Old Testament when when God appears to people and he mm. appears in the form of a man, but God doesn't have a physical body like right. But, yeah. But Jesus does. <laughs> it, it's 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 um, it, it's it, that, that's kind what of, motivates them and, and, and so it's it's not philosophy, it's biblical exegesis. Yeah, and, and I, I get that. It's it's you know, and and, and that puts um it, it, it sort of torpedoes this idea that um, that the the church was just sort of engaging with Greek philosophy and came mm. up with a Greek looking Hebrew God, yeah. you know, when really, as you've just pointed out, the the church fathers were trying to they were engaging with the scriptures. Mm -hmm. um, I sort of circling back to the councils because I, I know you say yeah. that certainly in the first two creeds, um, yeah, sorry, the first two councils. There wasn't that much philosophy it was just biblical statements yeah, sort of was. being pulled out and, and put together but as the the councils go forward um you know when they start talking about the wills when they start mm -hmm. talking about being divine and human um they're, they're using obviously they start getting yeah. more into philosophy there yeah, and sure. and in what way are they uh, if you if you can in what way are they yeah. using philosophy yeah, that's that's a good point. Uh, so certainly, I, I think you're right. So as, as you go along in all these kind of councils that we uh, we tend to think of more as Christological, but um, although I have a friend who just wrote a paper about the Trinitarian theology in the Sixth Ecumenical Council, so he's arguing that Interesting. there's actually a lot, you know, still talk about the Trinity as, as you go on. But but I think you're right. You, you do start to see that there's more philosophical or, or metaphysical sort of um, uh, I don't know if you want to call it logic chopping or what, but they, they mm. start getting more sort of nitty gritty about uh, about those issues. Um, I think are I was using it. In, are they using it as um, for discipleship? Are they using it as a as a means for evangelization? Or you know, like, like what is their use of the yeah the philosophy? I I, I guess my off the top of my head, what I would say about that is I, I think that they're just trying to be clear and precise. Mm. Right? So it's for discipleship um, purposes. Well, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. Right. I mean, at, at that point in time, right, most of the people in the Roman Empire are, are Christian anyway. And I, I think it's more they're trying to kind of work out. Um, I think they're trying to work out a coherent system of thought, right, that um, mm -hmm. One of the things that, that I think a lot of theologians will agree about is that you um, it, one thing that happens in the fourth, fifth, sixth, well, I guess the third through the sixth council is um, you have people using terminology sort of in different ways at different times. And in particular, uh, you sometimes have people using a certain set of terms one way when they're talking about the Trinity and then a different way when they're talking about the Incarnation. And there's this kind of like, well, do we need to have a consistent set of terminology here? You know, yeah. Um, and I think that's part of what's um, what's going on there. I, I think it's just uh, a worry that there's um, there's starting to be inconsistencies between these two different areas of theology, and we need to have a consistent, coherent. Yeah, way it's to kind of like to, to to me, it seems like they're that they're, they're taking what scripture is giving mm. the, the sort of mm. the, the the topography that is laid out for us in scripture and what they're doing is they're they're mapping that out in yeah. their philosophy yeah. in in detail you know yeah. so it, it's kind of like someone who's got a map someone who's making a map of a certain landscape mm. the, the the scriptures contain the landscape and the philosophy and the use of philosophy is creating the map of that landscape so that someone can, without looking at the, without actually being on the landscape, can look at it and understand what the landscape is. I think that's something that's, that's roughly right. I, I think they're, yeah, they're trying to get a kind of perspicuous, clear picture of, of what's going on in scripture. 
And then within and maybe that, what you're asking about is like, you know, to what extent did philosophy like motivate ideas within theology versus just being used to kind of clarify it? And <laughs> yeah, I'm just trying to understand um, or get your perspective on the relationship between philosophy and scripture philosophy and the councils and and also you know we can incorporate all three but maybe move on to this part um philosophy and mystery mm -hmm. you know because there is a point at which i think personally uh, w the the map can't be any more detailed than it is and we just have to accept that we can't yeah. get it down to every blade of grass you, you know yeah, yeah. we've got Which to let right. i mean you can't yeah you can't it, the the map becomes useless when it's life-sized. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. You know. I think, I think that's right. Yeah. And 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 so you know, uh, in in when I guess what I'm saying is, and 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 you know, this is a, a point that I'd like you. Uh, I'll throw this ball at you, and you can tell me uh, what you think about it. Is that as Christians, we shouldn't get too hung up on the philosophical language um mm -hmm. and we must accept that just as certain just as maps have different levels of accuracy philosophical descriptions have different mm -hmm. levels of accuracy so a classic example to that based on our last conversation um the last time that i spoke with you i admitted that i was more an egalitarian trinitarian mm -hmm. sort of like in my understanding of the trinity and having talked to you uh, and looked into it more I've become solid, solidly monarchical. Oh, really? Okay. In my... Yeah, 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 absolutely. That was from talking to you. So it wasn't a waste of time after all. Yeah, okay. I'm hairier yeah. and I'm a, monarch a monarchial. So, right. you know, you succeeded. <laughs> um, but like, it's it's kind of like the, uh, you know, because I, I think that the, the monarchial philosophical description lays easier over scripture yeah, yeah. than the egalitarian one. Right. But that doesn't mean that the egalitarian map of the Trinity is completely useless. Mm -hmm. It just means you've got a, a bigger chance of getting lost. Yeah, I think that's a good way to put it. Yeah, I, that's that's kind of part of why I, I talk about it as much as I do. Is I, th I think in particular, there are a lot of people like Unitarian Christians, maybe Muslims too, that, that kind of... Um, they, they look at they see a kind of disconnect between the way that God is talked about in the Bible versus the way it's talked about in certain kinds of Trinitarian discourse. And, mm -hmm. you know, people are using and I, I just wrote a chapter in a in a kind of debate. Or, or, more, or if I sorry, Bo, if I may jump in just on that thought or more that they they compare different maps. And they yeah, argue, yeah. look, you've got different maps, right. so therefore you've got different doctrines. And it's like, no, one's right, just right. more accurate than another. Yeah, I, I, yeah, and I, I think, uh, I think it's a stumbling block for some people because they just think like the doctrine of the Trinity sort of means that it's this egalitarian view or whatever. And if they don't quite see that way of speaking in the old in the New Testament or so, then they think, well, this just must be wrong. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it's not clear to me. I, I just wrote a chapter about this and I, it's in some cases, yeah, it's not clear to me that certain uh, like other ways of speaking about the Trinity couldn't just sort of be relabeled. And you've got basically the same view. Um, I, I say this about like William Hasker has a view about the Trinity where, you know, the, he believes in the eternal generation of the son and the eternal procession of the spirit and so I'm like, well, it, but he usually talks about the Trinity as God. And I, I just said, I, it's not clear to me that you, he couldn't just sort of relabel the things in his model and end up being a monarchical Trinitarian. But, yeah. So, yeah. So in some cases, it just looks like it's, it's people have, it's a stumbling block for people because the labels have been switched around, um, maybe for polemical purposes or just for some rhetorical purpose. But then they don't see that that's maybe that's as shallow as as it is like it seems like a deeper issue i think yeah. for some models of the trinity it is a deeper issue but for some it's it really may just boil down to different ways of speaking about the same thing and might yeah. not be as important and 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 i i i think you know like for, as you know i'm ecumenical um in my 
approach to the Christian faith. Mm -hmm. So I'm always looking for the unity between different churches. So, you know, I I, I think, uh, you know, my my own perspective on the Philoque, for instance, which is a Mm -hmm. a, a, a contentious point for many, is that there's a perfectly there's a there's a there's a way to interpret the Philoque that you know Western right, Orthodoxy right. would be completely happy with. Yeah, you know. Well, I think actually, um, I think a lot of Orthodox theologians would would say that that there there are interpretations of it that aren't problematic. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, I, I wouldn't say it's canonical because you know there wasn't a council right that sort of produced it, but. I think it's a if you interpret it in certain ways, it's a completely valid theological position to hold. Mm-hmm. But you, whether you could say it in a liturgy is a is a sort of separate yeah, question yeah. Yeah. connected to yeah, to true. canon law. So, um, so it, it to sort of summarise then. I think you know the the point that I you know uh, we seem to agree upon is this idea that philosophy is like the map of a of a topography. Mm-hmm. The topography is, in this case, the doctrine of the Trinity, and philosophy and, and our dis- the discourse within the church is the different people making the map of that topography. Right. Some achieve it with greater degrees of accuracy than others, but there is a point at which we cannot list every tree, every brook, right. every rock, every blade of grass, yeah. and so we have to accept there is a point at which our map cannot go any further. Yeah. And it, it, it would, would, would that be a, a sort of fair way to understand the relationship between philosophy and doctrine? I think so. Yeah. I think you, you get kind of a, a more philosophical sort of description of the truths of, of faith that have been delivered in the scripture and through, through prophets and apostles and so forth. Um, yeah, that's, that's just an attempt to kind of lay things out in a clear, in a rationally clear sort of way. Um, uh, yeah, to just to just give you a different kind of the different kind of description of the same hopefully yeah. same ideas. Right? Yeah. So, so that being said, now we've kind of framed the the the, the conversation going forward. A, a lot of people, and even the church itself, has done this. Has has um, anathematize people from the past mm-hmm. because they haven't necessarily got the sort of most up-to-date map you know like the one that's more detailed and and yeah. so their perhaps their descriptions in the past were a bit more clumsy or maybe didn't emphasize a bit of the topography and so like i'm thinking of origin you know mm-hmm. who i'm a secret fan of though i recognize that he's not a church father yeah um, you know, or like a tricky issue because you know he was anathematized uh, posthumously, which a lot of people have you know argued like, well, is that is it fair to anathematize someone, you know, after their their death? Um, sorry, was, Dr. Burwiger. Oh, Internet sorry. Problem. Okay. Uh, I think the the problem's on my side. It could be on my side. I had this happen the, the other day. I'm gonna. You know, you might off me. Um, I might get kicked. You might will have to kick me off and and put me back on or something. Okay, we'll just hope for internet settle down for a bit. Okay, are you there? Yeah, I'm here, Doctor Bo. Can you hear me? Can you? Yeah, I can hear you fine. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now. Your video is a little blurry, but I can hear you. Brilliant. Just so you know, it's happened a couple of times where I've been kicked my own live stream. So you might be going solo for a few minutes, okay. <laughs> but I'll get back in as soon as I can. That's um, all right. I'll just monologue for a while. I'll just just continue I'll the say, lecture without me. I'll, I'll um, say all my, I'll, uh, I'll just say a bunch of anti-Protestant, uh, you know, venom while you're off screen. And, and don't, no, I'm just kidding. I won't do that. Um, yeah. Um, but, uh, <laughs> That's. Yeah, there's not oh, actually. So, unfortunately, yeah, there's not a, there's not a lot of, of bad mouthing I would I'd want to do. So, so okay. coming back to origin, then you know, um, yeah, we, yeah. The last thing that I heard you say was he was excommunicated posthumously, and uh, and and lots of people have a problem with that. Yeah, yeah. A lot of people have debated whether that makes sense and is is fair. And the 
the reason for that, so, uh, you know, you had mentioned it uh, or before the stream to me, this, you know, uh, there, there's a Roman Catholic distinction between material heresy and formal heresy, which uh, I don't necessarily hear it a lot among Orthodox, but I think it's a useful distinction um, where material heresy is just, you know, actually false heretical beliefs, right? Um, which all of us have, like, right? Like, so everyone is probably a material heretic, right? Uh, formal heresy is when, you know, you've got this wrong belief um, and you are corrected about it by someone who is legitimately in authority over you, right? And you just w willfully reject that correction and, and defy that, right? Which is why you don't see uh, in the, the history of, of Christianity, you don't actually see a lot of like laymen being excommunicated for heresy, right? Mm. Um, because, it, I mean, it, you know. Th it's unfair. Well, it's, it's unfair, but it's also, I mean, it's not really that, it's just not a big issue, right? If someone's not preaching it, right? The people that get excommunicated are, are almost always either priests or bishops or someone who has a preaching role, or they would be maybe laity who, uh, you know, teach like a catechism class, you know, they, they have some sort of teaching sort of role or something. And they're teaching and preaching things that are wrong. And, and like their bishops, so like with Arius, you know, he was a priest and his bishop told him, hey, you're scandalizing everybody with this stuff. You know, people, are, why are you teaching this? This isn't right. Stop doing it. And Arius just kept on preaching it anyway. Hmm. Right. And that's something that people don't get a lot is, is that there's this with, with the with, with heresy, like people think of it sometimes as just a matter of believing the wrong stuff or something. And it's really not what the issue is. The, the issue is it's a sin of pride, right? So yeah. Arius maybe really thought that he had things figured out the right way. And may, maybe he was sincere about that. But his, you know, when, when you sign up to be a priest, it's it's like being a soldier, right? You don't You don't get to call the shots. You obey your superior officer right and so if your bishop yeah. tells you stop preaching this then you just say okay you know e even if you think that he's wrong you just that's what you signed up for right and then there's yeah. a council where a bunch of priests and some other bishops get together and they're like no this is still wrong and so then he just you know he's excommunicated so he just went to a different he went to like the, the middle east he left africa and went to the middle east and was yeah. like hey, maybe you guys will let me preach. And it's like, hey, that's not, <laughs> that's not yeah, the rule. That's not cool. Yeah. So, you know, and then there's a big ecumenical council and they're like, yeah, you know, we all say this is wrong and you you need to stop doing this. It's, it's that willful defiance, the pride that like, you know, there could be 300 something bishops from all over the world come together and tell you, you know, 99% of them say that you're wrong and stop preaching this. And you're just like, no. I know yeah. better than all of you, right? That's the that's the sinful aspect of it is is the aspect of pride and that I need mm -hmm. to have my way, right? Yeah. Um, and and so that's also why people, you know, some people argue that, you know, the thing with origin is a little unfair because of course if you go back to like Justin Martyr, or the, there's all sorts of people in the early church that said things that either they were just flat out wrong or they maybe said things in a way that wasn't very, you know, the maps had wasn't errors. Very, it wasn't very accurate or, you know, it was kind yeah. of an unfortunate turn of phrase or something, but we don't excommunicate them or think they're not saints or something because, because it was before we hammered out, you know, how are we going to have this, how are yeah. we going to use our terminology? And no one corrected it, right? No one, it, you know, we, we don't know that if if someone had said to Justin Martyr, hey, this this way that you characterize things is really not accurate. We don't know if he would have said, oh, screw you, I'll just do what I want. Or if he would have said, oh, you're right, that's, I shouldn't have said it that way, right? Exactly, because there's, there's a bit of a, a modern polemic that's emerging from some quarters where, you know they're attacking they're, they're attacking the doctrine of the trinity because an earlier father of the church mm. had a less accurate map 
than yeah. a later father of the church because the later father of the church had had the benefited had benefited from more yeah. reflection and more study of the scripture and right. you know a, a collected wisdom right um whereas the earlier church fathers didn't necessarily have a collected wisdom they were essentially the foundations of the reflections that others were doing and so their map of the topography or their right. map of the doctrine was was less accurate um and that's yeah, and a, a lot of kids so, to add to that i mean in a lot of cases it's just that you know you might not think about some of the implications of of a certain way of putting things as a university professor mm -hmm. i'm very aware of this because every semester i get really bad undergraduate essays <laughs> poorly yeah. written poorly thought and i'll sit down sometimes with students with a draft of their paper and it, it's not that their idea is totally incoherent but it's just there's certain things they haven't thought about and i say mm. to them, you know if i really take this phrase very literally it would have this implication like is that really what you want to say or do you want to say it do you want to phrase it this way so that it has just the implications you want and not and you know and a lot of times they're just kind of like oh yeah yeah you know i hadn't thought about that and it's 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 not that yeah. they're radically changing their their idea it's just they hadn't thought about the way that they phrase things right and and so yeah. similarly right in in the early days of of christianity there's there's plenty of times when people phrase things in ways that are in retrospect not the best way to phrase it right but it's not clear yeah. that they really maybe wanted these heretical implications but they just maybe didn't think about the way to phrase it yeah, and I, I, th I think, I, I, like, you know, for everyone who watches this, I want to underscore that point 10 times. Yeah. You know, not only because of its application to our understanding of the development of the map, the development of the, the, the philosophical descriptors and guidance that the church gave us about the doctrine of the Trinity, but also in our relationships to one another. Mm -hmm. Like, you know... You know, not not because you might have studied the Trinity to the nth degree, and then you meet this lovely, you know, elderly lady who's gone to church faithfully every Sunday, but never yeah. picked up an academic book in her life. And the yeah. way she tries to describe God and the Trinity is totally erroneous. You know, mm -hmm. doesn't mean that you should declare her a heretic and athematizer and and try right. to cast yeah. out devils and demons. It's kind of like have some intelligence. Yeah emotional intelligence to the and yeah we, we've we've got that obviously with you know like after the council of nicene the mm. groups that emerged out of the after the council athanasius was accepting groups yeah. who did have and didn't have a canonical um formula of the trinity yeah yeah famously in this uh, i think it's to the antiochians that he has this you know discussion of uh, how he he went um, and there was a group of people that were saying um, there are three UCI uh, and three hypostases. And there's this other group of people that said, you know, there's only one UCI and only one hypostasis. And so not neither of them had the canonical sort of, you know, one UCI, three hypostases. Um, <clears throat> And, you know, they both thought each other were heretics and it was a big deal. And Athanasius went and he said, look, I went to the one group and I asked them, what do you mean when you use the word usia? And what do you mean when you use the word hypothesis? And he says, well, these people explained to me that, you know, we just use them the same, that we mean the same thing. And when we say there's three, we just mean, you know, Father, Son and Holy Spirit aren't like three different names for the same thing, like. Uh, yeah. And he was like, well, that's right. They're they're right. And then he went to the ones that were the set only one. And they're like, well, we mean, you know, they're not like three different kinds. They're not like we're not Aryans, you know, as you've just got like, you know, different yeah. kinds of, of things that, you know, one's created and one's not or whatever. And he's like, well, that's right. And and he he was very clear that, you know, we shouldn't be hung up on the terminology that we're using. Uh, as long yeah. as the ideas are the same. And it, it's something I pointed out in one passage of my dissertation that the fathers are all very clear about this whenever it comes up. They they always say this, that orthodox, the way I think Gregory Nyssa put it was orthodoxy is not a matter of sounds and syllables. 
You know, it's mm. not just a matter of like harmonious sounds that you're making with your, you know, your vocal cords or something. He's like, it's about the ideas, right? Yeah. I, and I think in, you know, like these, it kind of, it kind of sounds like a bit like, um, you know, a typical Christian union dinner from university days where two people would sit next to one another, talk until they found something to disagree about. Yeah. Then have a three hour debate about stuff only yeah. to conclude after like three hours. Oh, we, we were actually saying the same thing. We basically believe the words. same thing. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and I, and I, and I think that there's a lesson in that for, for a lot of our brothers and sisters. Um, so I, I, I thought that it was important to try and frame uh, the, the relationship between philosophy and doctrine well, um, because of what we're now going to move on to. Um, you know, because um, when when we talked last time, uh, we we talked about your your thesis, um, which I mean I don't know the full title, but I know it tackled what was called logical the logical problem, problem of the Trinity. Of the Trin yeah. Logical problem of the Trinity. Okay, and and you know you explained about you know Gregory Nice's um, understanding of of how do we count the action. Mm -hmm. um, as a demonstration of the unity of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, in that they're performing a singular action. Um, am I, am I re-explaining your position correctly? You know, correct yeah. me at any point if I'm getting it wrong. Um, okay. Right. So, if if we are saying that the maybe you could just sort of pad that out for people who have who have not heard that. Um, um, just kind of the the basics of that there. of that view sorry it's kind of you're frozen now for me okay can you hear me now yeah now can, I can you see it. my head yeah. nodding yeah. yeah 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 i i think the uh, i've got weak internet on my side at the moment it just you up today you know so we'll just wait until we're we're back in touch okay we'll hopefully settle down so can you hear me? Yeah, I can I can hear you. Great, I can hear you. So what was the last thing you pick it up from there? Um so just say again what you wanted me to comment on from my from my dissertation. Yeah, just just in short summary form, um explain how the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit what do we mean when we say that there's a unity of action between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Okay, yeah. So uh it can so maybe I'll, I'll start with some things that that it's not so you know we might say like you and i are jointly doing this live stream right so there's a sense in which we're both cooperating in like the same action but really right uh you're over there speaking into your computer's microphone and i'm over here so like the live stream itself is kind of this big complex action that breaks up into little parts and you're doing part and I'm doing part. Right. And as creatures who exist in time and space, that's the best we can do. Right. We can, we can cooperate in, in that way on, on kind of a bigger, you know, project, but like, um, you know, I, I can't, if, if you reach out and, and, you know, tap one key on your keyboard. I can't be like tapping the same key in the same place at the same time, right? Yeah. Even if we try to, you know, maybe different corners of it or something, but we can't literally do exactly the same action. But with the persons of the Trinity, what Gregory of Nyssa says is they literally do the same actions. And the mm. reason for that is that they are not limited or separated by time and space, right? So, um, you and I can't be in the same place at the same time, so we can't literally mm -hmm. do the same actions. But the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit can literally be in the same place at the same time. And they can literally be in the same place in time as, as a creature, too, right? Because they're not limited in that way. So <clears throat> take something like uh, just the creation of the universe. Uh, Gregory would say, the Father created the universe... Uh, but so did the Son, and so did the Holy Spirit, right? So you got these verses like, by the the word of his, 
of his, what is it? The, um, by his wow. word, the heavens established and by the spirit of his, uh, or you know, the breath of his mouth or whatever, which in the original language is spirit. Yeah. Um, so, you know, there, there's this language that the, the father, son, and Holy spirit are all creating. Right. Um, but it's literally, but there's only one universe, right? There's, there's just yeah. one act of creation. Um, that also, by the way, explains how we can say things like, um, you know, Moses parted the Red Sea and also God parted the Red Sea, uh, mm -hmm. or Elisha raised the Shunammite, you know, woman's son from the dead, but so did, you know, God raised him from the dead. Yeah. Um, or if you notice in the New Testament, it, you know, uh, the father raises the son from the dead and then it says he raises him by the Holy spirit. And then it says the yeah. son raised himself from the dead. Right. Yeah. So <clears throat> that's the idea is that with the persons of the Trinity, they, they literally can do the same token action. Right. Brilliant. Um, no, I think, I think that, 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 that's, was there something, a next point that was important qualifier yeah, yeah, well, or the, is it? The reason that that's important for him is, because he thinks that the word God, as it's used in the Bible, does not actually predicate the divine nature of a yeah. thing. And the, the reason for that is he says, look, there's, there's tons of things that are called gods in the Bible. So that goes back to this uh, psalm that I just read at the beginning, right? Mm -hmm. um, God stands in the congregation of the gods, and yeah. being in their midst, he judges the gods, Right. Mm. Um, and you'll find this language like in Exodus, right? It says that Yahweh executed judgment on all the gods of Egypt. Right. Yeah. Um, so there's all this language in the Old Testament that it doesn't look like it's just saying that they're figments of people's imaginations or something. It looks like these are real entities that God, uh, you know, it even says God is the God of gods. He's a, mm. a great God. of so you get this picture that there's there's all sorts of gods and then there's the God, right? And even yeah. another example he gives is Moses. He says, God says, I will make you a God to Moses. Yeah. So Gregory says, uh, Pharaoh, the, I'll make the you word God, God isn't, isn't ascribing the divine nature to something. Um, it's ascribing some kind of power or some sort of activity that they are able to do. Hmm. Um uh, now, there's another sense in which, of course, there's one God, right? So there's it says there's one God. God is one, and there's no other. Um, and in that sense, that that kind of ties into the the monarchy of the of the Father, right? Oh, there's the only Father, one. Yeah. There's only one source, um, and there's kind of two, you know, two levels to that. There's only, there's a source within the Trinity, which is the Father, and then the Trinity as a whole, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit together act together to create right so yeah. the father is kind of the source within the trinity and then the trinity as a whole is the source of the creation in all of the gods you know the created gods we now would call angels and demons right and does gregory of nisus um identify the action that he sort of predicates the unity on as the act of creation or does he leave you know, it unspecified he, um, or is it he's all the actions? Super, he, he's he doesn't really commit to specifically what action that is. There's yeah. kind of a, a false etymology that was popular at the time that said that theos comes from theostai, which means like to see, um, yeah. or like theoria is sight. So he thought like you know maybe it has something to do with sight, um, with uh, being able to like see hidden things or see mm. into the hearts of people. There's a verse in the Bible, you know, I think it's Chronicles where it says that, you know, thou alone uh, seest to the hearts of men. Yeah. Uh, which interestingly, Jesus in the New Testament says he could see the hearts of men. He knew the hearts of men. Yeah. Um, so Gregory thinks maybe it's something like that, like being able to kind of know these like hidden things in people's hearts or minds. Mm. But he's he doesn't really commit to that. He doesn't really say specifically what it is. Like, you know, cre creation would make sense. I mean, that could be you know. Uh, but yeah. his, his his bottom line is just that it's um, uh, the question whether the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit sort of count as 
three gods in this other sense, right? This sense which there are many gods, but but are they three gods in that sense? He says no, because uh, they don't perform three acts of you know whatever this activity is. So it, suppose mm. it was creation. Suppose the word God mean meant something like creating. Um, there's not three acts of creation, so there's only one creator, uh, which is sort of father son. So it together. Dr. Bo, if you just pause for a second. Sure, sure. Dr. Bo, if you just pause for a second, because we, we... If you just pause for a second, Dr. Bo. Yeah. I'm... Uh, yeah, I, I'm really sorry. Tonight, uh, I, don't, I don't know whether the internet is a problem on my side or your side, but it's uh, it's just playing up at the, at, up at the moment. Yeah. Um, so... So I, I understood what you're saying in in terms of the the he, you know in terms of his explanation of the unity of God his map as it mm. the doctrine um, that we see in Scripture he um, identifies the unity of their action as being the source of their oneness as it were is that is that is that kind of what he's saying yeah. 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 Um, um, and 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 you know like that that you know like so so my question regardless of of how we base the unity you know mm -hmm. like that's gregory nice's understanding and i don't know whether that's universal throughout the church fathers or you know is or or, or are the other are there other points of unity identified by other church fathers right. say different to gregory of nice's so um what I would say is this, that in, in the earlier, the earliest centuries of Christianity, the, the sense in which people are concerned about whether there's one God um, is the sense of monarchia being one source, right? Yeah. Um, and so um, I think early on to, up, you know, in the, in the Trinitarian controversy and up through Gregory of Nyssa, and well, really beyond i mean you can find this still as far up into like the byzantine era and today as, as you want but but there the the so what saint basil says is just in that sense of god there's one god because there's one father and that's that's yeah. the way basil puts it he says if you yeah. have two first principles you have two god so in the sense of monarchia it's kind of like obvious that the the, the trinity is not three gods because there's there's one source even within the Trinity, right? So there's there's a single source, yeah. right? Um, I think what happens is that uh, it's really the Arians originally who start saying, no, the word God means a being with the divine nature, and you've got three of them. So mm -hmm. you've got three, you've got three God. And Gregory still is uh, kind of on the same page with these pre-Nicene church fathers who all say that's not what the word God means. And so yeah. he says the, the real issue is, is this activity and they perform the same activities. So whatever activity the word God predicates, there's, there's just one of these things. So there's one, the, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are one creator. They're one savior. They're one redeemer. They're one God because it's all oh. activity. Right? So given but, that, given, I, given that, think, as... I do think that he he tries to accommodate the idea of the nature uh, being being what the word God means, and I think what you what happens is, I think it, later fathers kind of just sort of give into that, like, well, maybe it does mean nature, but we've got an answer to that too, uh, yeah. and then I think that in the West you you get this kind of like they just sort of forget about the activity issue and they, they just focus on the nature. Cause I, 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 I thought that the, um, and, and uh, it's my opinion that the, the Aryans and the church separated on whether it was homo oseus or homo ioseus. Yeah. Yeah. But homo ioseus means a like nature. So not yeah. the same nature. Not the same nature, but a similar nature. Yeah. 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 So yeah. you know, um, it, it, but but given that as the foundation, then 
um, or, or wherever we decide to place the unity of the Father, Son and Holy Spirit, which for me personally, mm. I just go to the essence. You know, the Son and the Holy Spirit have the same essence as the Father. Sure. And therefore, there is only one because there's only one essence. Um, it, it, how then are we able to speak about the, the the sort of hypostatic qualities of the Father, Son and Holy Spirit? So like the fact that the Father is uncaused, the Son is incarnate, the Holy mm -hmm. Spirit is proceeds, you know, because if they act as one, for instance, mm -hmm. we don't say that the Father is incarnate or that the Spirit is incarnate. We right, just say right. that the Son is incarnate. But then at the same time, we say the actions of Father, Son and Holy Spirit are one. Yeah. So, you know, what, what's your what's your sort of uh, yeah. how, how do you uh, think, think your way through that one? Yes, St. Augustine talks about this in, I, I think it's Epistle 11 of his, that, um, <clears throat> so the the issue there is where, if you think of, like, becoming incarnate as an action, right? So, like, it, it's sort of like me uh, walking into a room or something, right? Like, that's an action that I do. Hmm. Then yeah, then you'd kind of be confused, like well, you know, but the son does that, and the father and the spirit don't, so that's something that he does that they don't. Um, but he says is that's not the the way to to think about it, right? The the son becoming incarnate is like an event or a state of affairs, right? It's it's something that's being affected, right? It's something that's being done as he's he's becoming incarnate, and the father, son, and Holy Spirit all sort of jointly cause that. So, and I think, I think this might be David Bradshaw's example, but anyway, you know, he, he, I think it's him that gives this example of like, you know, if, if one man was trying to get into a pair of pants that are kind of too tight for him or whatever. So like two other people kind of help him out, you know, kind of, mm. it's like, I get on one side and pull this side up and whatever. Like they're sort of all jointly cooperating in the act of getting the one guy into these pants, right? Yeah. Um, so it's not that he's just sort of putting the pants on by himself. It's that the 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 pants getting onto him is something that all three of them are are doing. I think. I think and that's, that's the way that's yeah. the way Augustine thinks thinks of it is is it's like you know there's this ultimate there's this end product state of affairs that christ has the human nature right what causes that to happen what causes the pre-existent son of god to acquire a human nature is all three of the persons putting that human nature and that hypothesis were sort of together right yeah and and then uh, in in relation to the father being the uncaused cause of the mm -hmm. the son and the holy spirit which yeah. you know in our very uh, human terminology seems to imply this idea of chronology of time oh yeah of, yeah. of beginning um but yet we speak of the son as being begotten of the father and the spirit of mm -hmm. being breathed of the father right and therefore, the Father is the cause of the Son and the Holy Spirit, but obviously we assert without beginning, or you right. know. So, but but how does the Father have the quality of being uncaused, mm -hmm. whilst the Son has the quality of being caused, but yet are divine? Yeah, you know, are, are, are God. Yeah. So this actually, um, that's actually what most of the Arian controversy really was about, um, and we might talk about this in a in a minute, but. You know, today, the the way that we argue about the Trinity today, this issue of tritheism kind of takes the, it's like right in the foreground, right? Um, and you might expect that when you go back and read stuff from the fourth century, that, that people would be talking about that all the time. Um, and one of the things that I thought was really fascinating and kind of surprising when I really got into studying you know, fourth century debates about the Trinity, because I wanted to know about, you know, the tritheism thing is how mm. infrequently people even talk about it. Um, it it's it's not really um, it's kind of like a side argument for the Arians or like a backup argument. And it's yeah. something that the church fathers will just kind of be like, yeah, here's this response. And it's the the meat of it really does have to do with this issue of begetting. So the Arians thought of it kind of the way you were saying, like, 
they thought, well, begetting, if you think about human begetting, that is a, it's, I guess you wouldn't call it a punctiliary event. It's not some, I mean, maybe birth is something that happens, but anyway, generation and birth, it's something that happens in time, right? There, there has to be a beginning and it extends through time and then there's an end. And so Arians sort of transferred that temporal sort of idea to God and said, mm. well, there's got to be a beginning of this process, or at least it's got to happen at some point in time. And so that was why Arius said there was a time when there was no sun, right? There, yeah, he didn't exist, or at least he wasn't the sun because he had, you know, it had begetting has to happen at a moment in time. Um, what, um, what Athanasius says is, is look, you know, anytime you have these metaphors that we're taking from creation, you have to kind of strip them of the the created sort of connotations. You have to strip them of any any idea of anything material mm. or being limited in time and space. Yeah. And so you can't say that the begetting is something that, you know, involves like God taking a part of himself and you know, like a physical, separating it out. Yeah, ball of Play-Doh that he takes a little chunk out of. Yeah. And you can't think of it as something that happens in time or at a particular point in space. It just has to be this kind of eternal relation. And mm. one one way I think I think a good analogy that I think that's helpful is um, like the relation between a mind and an idea. Right. So um I think that was that doesn't doesn't Tertullian use that? Um, yeah, a lot of a lot of fathers do. Um, that you know, the the father is like a mind, and the son is like an idea, and so there's an obvious sense in which the mind is kind of. I mean, we even talk about like we use the language of conceiving. Like, if you can think of something, we say it's conceivable. Yeah. Or if you can't think of it, we say it's inconceivable. I can't conceive of that. So we use the language yeah. of conception when we're talking about an, a mind conceiving yeah. an idea, right? Yeah. Um, and, and they, the, the, an argument is, you know, it makes sort of sense because uh, minds are not physical material things and neither are mm. ideas, right? They're the mm. same kind of substance. They're the same kind of. Yeah. Thing. Yeah. But with, with God, of course, God always has an idea of himself. God is all knowing, right? So like you were talking about earlier, you know, a fully accurate map of something yeah. would, would have every blade. Of, it would be exactly like the territory, right? The life size. Yeah, actually, the yeah. life size of everything would be exact same shape and size and color. And, and yeah. so if God has a fully accurate map of himself, right because he has an idea of himself because he has self-knowledge yeah and he has this idea that's going to be you know to perfect use the language of like isomorphic or homomorphic we talk about things being having the same right they're exactly so so it's just like the biblical language of of christ is like the uh, image of the, the invisible exact God. image the exact image of his hypostasis and gregory nissa talks about that verse too that he's uh and so, yeah, if a mind is mental or spiritual and, a, and an idea is, they're the same kind of stuff. And they're, it's just like a mirror image. And there, if God is all knowing, right, then there's never a time when he doesn't have an idea of himself. Yeah. There, there couldn't be, right? Yeah. So it couldn't be something like, you know, God is just sort of hanging out and has no knowledge of himself. Uh, and then he sort of conceives of this idea of himself, right? Uh, it has to just be this eternal relation. Yeah. Uh, and so it's not something that happens at a moment in time. It's not something that involves physical matter being separated off or something. Mm. Um, but it is, um, um, you know, there is a way to make a distinction, right? That the, there, Obviously, there's a sense in which the mind is original and the idea is is a reflection of, of the mind, right? Yeah. I get that, I, and 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 I, I think that's that's well put. You, it's it's interesting that you mentioned how infrequently the the tritheistic debate is yeah. there in the church, yeah. and the reason why I mentioned that is because um, Jake, the the metaphysician who you mm -hmm. have debated with yeah. um, in the past, um, you know, in in my following of him, he is he is name dropping you 
uh, every opportunity yeah. in in a way of trying to frame and also your thesis as well as a way of trying to frame this idea of the logical problem of the trinity is this ever present pit that the mm. church is just on the precipice of falling into and we're constantly trying to dodge it and avoid it and it's and and it, it's a, a problem that we've been struggling with for since the time of the church fathers but what you're saying is very different uh, i just uh, wonder yeah. what your comment on that would be um you know is jake being fair to the history of the church or is he being uh, well, a, a little bit is he misrepresenting the logical problem of the trinity is this great danger yeah. that the church is always in the midst two, of falling into two things i would like to say about that so i mean number one no i don't think that's the uh i don't think that's historically accurate uh, at all which we can talk about um but number two uh i don't i don't have any idea how anyone would get that out of my dissertation or anything that i've written on the trinity um, oh, to, be, to, to be fair to him i i think if he's just sort of dropping your okay, okay. name into it i he is getting something that he's he is claiming to get something from your dissertation and we're going to look at that okay. um yeah. you know but he's he's sort of name dropping you along with others like um joshua Sidwadi right. as and then some early church fathers you know like gregory of nicaea uh, as 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 Nisa, sorry, as as sort of, and he, the way it's just the way that he kind of sort of leads yeah. it out. It makes it sound like yeah. the church has always been wrestling with a tritheistic problem. And I've, in all my studies, I've never encountered this at all. Like, yeah, I, I don't. I mean, that's actually one of the things. Like I was saying, one of the things that surprised me the most when I really started digging into it is is how actually how hard it is to find um, places where this comes up and people address it specifically. So Gregory of Nyssa is, um, I, I mean, a lot of church fathers mention it, but their discussion of it will often be very brief um, mm -hmm. in, in a way that indicates that they, they really didn't, um, it, it's not like brief, like they try to get around. I mean, they, they give, what they take to be a satisfying answer and then they just kind of move on so it it looks like they just didn't really feel like it was that big of an issue not not the way that people portray it today yeah. um so i talk about gregory of nissa in my dissertation partly just because he's one of the few people that really devotes like he devoted two short uh writings to it uh ad oblabium and ad graecos to, to oblabius and to the Greek, yeah. both of which, by the way, are not, I mean, they're not like really book length treatment. I mean, they're, they're these very short, they call them his minor Trinitarian treatises. Hmm. He has these, you know, I've got, uh, well, minor Trinitarian treaties for two, minor Trinitarian so problems. Two of, of volumes of, of his three volumes of uh, Contra Eunomius, but, and you'd think, oh, my, this is all about the problem of the Trinity, but, you know, most of it's about begetting and, and that sort of thing. It's, it's, there's not a ton about the tritheism thing in there. Yeah. Um, and, uh, yeah, and the same thing, I mean, you, I was so just reading something of on. Thomas Aquinas the other day where he's, it's a work of his against most in, in response to Muslims and some other groups. And, um, the issue of tritheism doesn't even get its own like chapter. It's just like a, there's a few paragraphs at the end of a section on the Holy spirit where he's like, oh yeah, also they say it's tritheism, but here's why. No. Yeah, it just doesn't look like it doesn't look to me like people really having like a ton of anxiety about this issue. Um, so, yeah. and so also, what's the I would say, uh, to, to, to yeah. finish about my thesis too? Though, just it, you know, the point of my thesis, the whole the the thesis, what it, what the thesis is, is that there there is no logical problem of the Trinity. It was solved in the fourth century by Gregory of Nyssa. I mean, that's that the whole point is like, you know, people say that it's this big issue, and oh, people have always been dealing with it. And and I say, like, if you just look at what Gregory says right there in the fourth century, that is a solution. He he gives an answer to it, and it's yeah done. Yeah, so that, that's kind of the point of my whole dissertation. I, I think I think it's a case of I, I think it's a case of the fact that you have zoomed in 
on a very discreet package yeah. of information mm -hmm. from the fourth century has magnified that and then yeah, jake is so. jumping on the back of that and going look we've got this right. massive problem and it's like no <clears throat> it's that yeah. one scholar has, has has zoomed in on a very small discreet package of yeah. information and that has enlarged it but it wasn't a big thing yeah that and is the, that fair? the reason that i yeah that's i think it's totally fair the, the reason that i talked about th that i focused in on this one issue is because that's an issue that is talked about by philosophers a lot. So, um, I yeah. mean, the, the doctrine of the Trinity sort of, <clears throat> at least in, in the West, by anyone's, I think, admission, um, until Karl Rahner came along, it kind of was just ignored for a long time. It was kind of a little, just something we just, it's over here. A settled it's question. That we don't really talk about it. And it was really like yeah. Rahner and some other people in like the 60s and that that, that that sort of had, there's been this Trinitarian revival and people are interested in it again. Mm -hmm. And so then, and also, uh, you know, analytic philosophy in the early half of the 20th century was, everyone was an atheist, or if you weren't, then you're afraid to say that you're not. I mean, there's yeah. very few people talking about philosophy, religion. So it's only been since like the 80s that, um, there was a philosopher named Richard Cartwright who wrote this paper on the logical problem of the Trinity. And then there's been a few, you know, there's kind of gradually some people wrote other papers and got more interested in it. And so it's only been in kind of recent years that people, philosophers have gotten interested in it. And they mostly have started from what Richard Cartwright wrote, mm. uh, which was this kind of, you know, basically how do you make it not be tritheistic? And he kind of, you know, talks about it and, and just leaves it up in the air and says, I yeah. don't know, who knows? So I, you know, I'm responding to kind of contemporary analytic philosophers who that's kind of where they start from. And what I'm trying to do is say, look, you're thinking about it in, in a vacuum and it looks like this big logical conundrum for you. But if you go back to the fourth century and actually read the church fathers and see what they say about it, the you know the solution to this problem is is there and yeah. there's a lot of more interesting stuff i mean like you know like i was showing i mean these this stuff is i mean there's a lot of philosophy and interesting ideas going on in that debate but it's um yeah it's not just kind of the tritheism thing it, it's so, that, so let me just let me just read to you something that i saw on his okay. channel uh, and give you the opportunity to reply Okay. And I'm going to read it to you, but you jump in and interrupt me at any point okay. that you wish to. Okay. Um, uh, so here we go. Will the Eastern Orthodox be able to explain to us what the necessary and sufficient conditions are for two beings possessing the same Aristotelian essence, or will they hide behind ambiguities? I guess Aquinas didn't understand the notion of essence and powers. On the contrary, whatever the this is a quote from um, Aquinas Summa Theologia, Part Three, Question Three, Article Three. On the contrary, whatever the Son can do, so can the Father and the Holy Ghost. Otherwise, the power of the three persons would not be one. But the Son was able to become incarnate; therefore, the Father and the Holy Ghost are able to become incarnate. Mm. Uh, what does John of Damascus say? That's um, Jake speaking, and then he quotes John of Damascus and. Exposition of the Orthodox Faith, mm -hmm. Book 4, 4. Obviously, we're taking it for granted that he's quoted these accurately. I have no reason to believe that he isn't. Mm -hmm. The Father is Father and not Son. The Son is Son and not Father. The Holy Spirit is Spirit and not Father or Son. For the individuality is unchangeable. How indeed could individuality continue to exist at all if it were ever changing and altering? Wherefore, the Son of God became Son of Man in order that his individuality might endure. For since he was the Son of God, he became Son of Man, being made flesh of the Holy Virgin and not losing the individuality of sonship. And then Jake goes on. So the Father alone has the power to cause another divine person to exist. Son and Spirit lack this ability. The Son alone has the power to become incarnate. Father and Spirit lack this ability. Yet the persons have the same powers and dispositions, which entails that they possess the same essence. Sure, 
still waiting for an objective criteria for the claim that they share one power and will in the light of numerous differences in not only action, but ability to perform certain types of actions. This is where he speaks, this is where he drops you, you know. Branson failed to provide the response to this line of argumentation, which Aquinas and other Catholics would agree with. Hence, one of the motivations of the Philoque. Now, I, I wouldn't bite the bait on him trying to set up a Catholic Orthodox fight here, because that's just a typical Dai tactic. Yeah. Um, otherwise, the father would possess the abilities that the son lacks, which is problematic for the unity of the Trinity. So, um, how would you um, how would you respond to that? Well, they're okay. There's a lot there. Um... <clears throat> I mean, it's it's mostly right. about uh, essentially most of it is just an intro to this idea that you know the the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I'll just quote the key line, mm. still waiting for an objective criteria for the claim that they share one power and will in light of numerous differences in not only action, but ability to perform certain types of action. So, yeah, let's, let's stop there. So <clears throat> the the issue with the son becoming incarnate. So um, I don't know why I, I don't know what the point is of him quoting Aquinas and then. Jonathan he's Matt. just he's just doing a typical Dai thing of trying to set Catholics up against Orthodox so we fight one another. Yeah, but I mean, so I think everyone knows this that does medieval philosophy or anything, but uh, yeah, John of Damascus, uh, and that's still the position that uh, Orthodox Christians would take today, would say um, the son's hypostatic property, so uh, for viewers who maybe don't have this background, right? There, there's uh, such a thing as a kind essence, right? Um, so you and I are human beings. Uh, we have different accidental qualities, but fundamentally you're human, I'm human. That's the kind essence. But then everyone has, uh, let's say, hypostatic properties, right? Meaning personal uh, properties that individuate you from everyone else. So maybe like what parents you have, right? So like, um, I could have had a different color of eyes, maybe, or hair or something. Um, I could have been taller or shorter, and it'd still be me. But if I, uh, you know, arguably, if I was born to different parents or something, that wouldn't really be me, that would just be someone else that looked like me, or, you know, I couldn't have had different DNA or something like that. So people have these, you know, you have a, a property or a set of properties that are unique to you as an individual as opposed to you know essential to you because of the kind of thing that you are so um that's kind of the basis of the doctrine of the trinity right the persons of the trinity have the same kind essence they have different individual properties and the son's individual or hypostatic property is to be begotten and so john of damascus says that's why it wouldn't uh, it wouldn't make any sense for the father to have become incarnate because his, you know, it, it, it's the unique property of the son among the Trinity to, to be begotten. So that's mm. his, his hypostatic property is compatible with becoming human and being born of a woman, being begotten as a man. That's not inconsistent with his individuality. Right. But John of Damascus says that would be inconsistent with the, uh, the father and the spirit because they they don't have that and can't have that, that, ha that hypostatic property as divine persons so for for you and me like just being begotten isn't isn't a hypostatic property um it's just kind of a general thing that most humans other than adam and eve uh, uh have yeah. but but it's the question is whether it's consistent right with with uh the the hypostatic properties of the persons and so John the Master says, no, you know, only Christ could have become incarnate. Um, other people like Aquinas, uh, there, there was debate about this in the Western church among the scholastics about, well, maybe they, you know, they could have. Aquinas is one of the people that came down on the side of um, that, that, yeah, the Father or the Holy Spirit could have been incarnate. Um, yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a theological debate that, that people have had. Um, his reasoning for it... Um, I, I mean, I don't find. Can I just jump in, sure, Doctor Bo? Because that yeah. would that would be an example of the, you know, like the first 
20, 30 minutes of this conversation was talking about philosophical yeah, maps yeah. over topography and, and different levels of accuracy that you can you can sit both of these different positions together as, well, one of them's right and the other one's wrong, but it's more a level of accuracy. It's not saying that they're not dealing with the same topic or belief, if you see what I'm saying. Yeah, I my way of putting it, I guess, my issue is... Um, a lot of times people do this where they find like they just find some issue where for two people disagree about something. Right. But it's like, it's not super clear that like it's th that the disagreement is that important. Um, yeah. I mean, I mean, it's in other words, like, yeah, I mean, maybe one of them's right and one of them's wrong. Um, but if so, I mean, you know, that, that doesn't show there's a some kind of deep problem with the doctrine of the Trinity or something, right? If, if hmm. one person got this detail right and the other person got it wrong. Or maybe, yeah, maybe they're just two different things are kind of underdetermined by the, the rest of the theory or something. Or, um, or I mean, yeah. but whatever. But it just, I don't really get how, like, in, in any case... Um, yeah, I just, I guess I just don't see what the, what the issue is. Um, but, but anyway, you get the idea. I mean, there's, there's disagreements about that, that issue. Aquinas is, is the argument he's giving is kind of assuming that incarnating is an activity, right? That any of them mm. could do. And so they, any of them could, could have become incarnate. Um, I don't, I don't think that's right. I mean, kind of for the same reasons as I mentioned earlier with Augustine's epistle 11, like I just, I don't think that's the right way to think about it. I mean, not surprisingly, I'm Eastern Orthodox, so I side with Jonathan. Yeah. But um, yeah. I, I guess it doesn't seem to me, I, I guess I'm not, it doesn't seem like this is a problem with the doctrine of the Trinity in particular. Mm. Um, I don't know, I mean, at least. It's I, not, I mean, because he's he was, one of the ways that this, this argument sort of expressed itself was when you had a debate with Jake about... Um, I think it was about the the eternally begotten mm -hmm. son, like mm -hmm. the, the father being the uncaused cause of the son. Yeah. Um, and if I remember correctly, you ended up having to do a logic box with him. And <laughs> if I've got the right debate, is yeah. this the one with the logic box? Have I got the right debate? Uh, yeah, that's the only kind of well, the only one. Because because I actually have the clip where oh, okay. I, and I I, I watched I'm this a... debate, and I <laughs> yeah. honestly, Doctor Bo. I've watched lots and lots of debates. I do lots and lots of debates, but I, in my life, I have never seen a debate so conclusively won by one side during the Q and A. You yeah. absolutely oh, yeah. destroyed yeah, they... his argument in the Q and A, and the logic yeah, box yeah. thing was just embarrassing, like on, on another level. But I can see your screen's frozen, so I just want to check you can still hear me. Nope, we'll just wait for him to come back. A uh, bit unlucky with the internet this evening. I don't know. Give us a, a, a test, guys. Can you hear us in the chat? All right, it's clearly my internet, I think. No. Oh. Can you? And okay. you're back. There we go. Um, sorry about that. I think that was my fault because it told me my internet was. Oh right. Well, the there we go. It looks like it looks like we're having fun all round here. All right. Um, right. Brilliant. So, what was the last thing you heard? And we'll pick up from there. Oh, just you were mentioning the this clip or the logic. Oh part. yeah. So. Oh, the so Q and A. Like... Yeah. The Q. Yeah. The Q and A was bad. I, I remember I asked him about God's two hands or whatever. Um, just because there's a, you know, th this is something that sometimes Trinitarians like St. Irenaeus calls the son and the spirit, God's two, two hands. Right. And I know different Muslims kind of interpret this different ways. Some of them take it very literally and some of them, you know, take it more metaphorically, but, um, yeah, I mean, either way, it, it seems like he thinks that, uh, there's such a thing and you know god has hands he has attributes and so forth and they are distinct from god 
but they are necessarily existent, but they're also in some way dependent on God. Like, so mm. it, it seemed like it, it was kind of, he ends up with basically the same, yes, the same issue with his worldview as, as he, yeah, as, as the one he's objecting to. Yeah. I thought, I, 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 I mean, it, it was, it was, Com like I say, uh, like because I don't know which point you froze, so I'll just repeat myself um, and, and pick up the same thread of thought. But you know, you you absolutely destroyed him in the Q and A section, and I've never seen a debate so conclusively won or an argument collapse as massively as that yeah. in a Q and A section. And it got to a point where you had to do a logic box to explain something. And I, I'm going to play the clip. Um, so that people can see what okay. what actually happened, um, it was it was on another level of um, of embarrassing. Let's just say. Um, bear with me one second. That's the one. Can you see that? Yeah. Let me just expand that out. Right. Is that full screen from your perspective? Uh, yeah basically back. you can tell i'm such a troglodyte with technology yeah right okay then so i'll i'll play that this is a review me, that i did with make Lewis. Sure. yeah yeah right let me just you when i when i play it just let me know if you can hear it because um i'll be honest i'm not really good with technology so okay i'll let it i'll thumbs up have to have an in can you hear that yeah it's a little quiet you can. yeah it's a little quiet but oh not sure how to turn it up, but no, that's all right. All right, so I'll I'll, I'll play it and um, and then we'll discuss it afterwards. Once okay. once we've played the full clip, it's a few minutes long. Or if you want to jump in at some point, just let me know and I'll pause it. Okay. Way of showing that that's true. The fallacy that you're you're making is trying to infer the logical converse of a proposition, right? So again. Uh, from if P then Q, it doesn't follow that if Q then P, right? So uh, so let's take this square here, right? So let's say these are uh, things that are dependent and contingent. Uh, these are things that are independent or they're necessary, right? Here's things that are uncaused and things that are caused. So the principle of sufficient reason gets rid of this, right? It, that doesn't have us, right? That's un. So if it's contingent, it's got to go down here in this caused spot. Uh, the cosmological argument, for example, says, okay, well, you've got all these things that are caused, but they can't just be caused in a circle, and it can't go on infinitely, right? So we need to get out of this caused section to something up here that's uncaused, right? But the only thing that's uncaused is going to be a necessary being. So that's kind of how the cosmological argument says. We got to get out of here. Yeah, yeah, but when what what that do you leaves, arrive? That leaves this box open, right? So this box says this is something that's independent. It's necessarily existent, but it does have a cause, right? It doesn't require a cause. It just happens to have one. Just like I have blue eyes, uh, the nature of human beings doesn't require me to have blue eyes. Uh, I just do. Yeah, I understand that, but I'm saying. It, under your conception, an ab alio thing, meaning something that's caused, right? You're saying that it must be contingent, but not all contingent things must have a cause. I don't understand. No, 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 no. So again, just back to the box. <laughs> so all, all contingent Well, the box is not helping me at all, to be honest with you. The box uh, is not I mean, helping that's, me. It's logic. So, I mean, if logic doesn't help, I don't know how to help <laughs> you, but... But no, because what you're saying, Bo, what you're saying, that's, what you're I mean, saying is not making any representation sense. of the truth table for a condition, right? Usually the way these kinds of, the, you know, like... There we go. So um, I'll thank Lewis for uh, for, for that. doing that. I mean, I, I, I've yeah. nicked it shamelessly off orthodox uh, Shahada, yeah. um, but I'm sure, I, I'm sure Lewis won't mind. Um, and if, you know, anyone who's not already signed up to Orthodox Shahada, I'd encourage them to do so. Um, you know, what, what, just, just explain how this, this logic box 
like you know because obviously there's lots of people here yeah. who haven't studied logic they haven't studied philosophy so sure. just explain how this relates to the sun begottenness and his caused by the uncaused father whilst right. not saying that he is a created thing so just explain that yeah, logic yeah. box and <clears throat> well so uh jake was so the the view here right the um what I was talking about with the principle of sufficient reason, the principle of sufficient reason says that if something is a contingent being, right, if it it doesn't exist in every possible world, right, uh, then it has to have a cause. Um, so, and that's I mean that's the uh, kind of you know, main principle behind the cosmological argument is like, well, I'm not a necessary being, you're not a necessary. You know, we see all these things that come into existence, so they're they're not necessary, they're contingent beings. Uh, they have to have some cause, right? But you can't just keep going back infinitely, right? So you've got to eventually get to something that's a necessary being that just, it's just in its nature to exist. It couldn't fail to exist, right? Um, and, and I affirm that, right? But that doesn't, uh, the, the the issue with with the sun and the spirit in in the monarchical sort of view of the Trinity, right, is uh, they're not contingent beings. So like I said earlier, you know, God's, you know, the mind and the idea, um, there's no possible world where God doesn't have his idea of himself, right? So it's necessarily existent, but there's still an obvious sense in which it's caused by or, you know, caused by the mind or the mind is more fundamental than the idea or however you want to put it. So that was the idea of, of aseity we were working with is, you know, an ase being an absolutely ase being is one that doesn't have a cause. It's not grounded. It's not dependent. It's not nothing. Right. So not, not any sense like that. So the mind would be, a, would be ase. The idea would be ab alio. It would be from the mind, right. Coming from the mind. But but there's no reason why you can't say that the sun isn't a necessarily existent being, right? Even if the sun's like the idea and, and the father's like the mind. What Jake was trying to do was infer from the principle of sufficient reason, which says if something's contingent, then it has a cause. It's ab alio. Um, he was trying to infer that if it's ab alio, then it has to be contingent. So if I say the Son and Spirit are mm. from the Father, then they have to be contingent beings and not exist in every possible world, right? And that's just a very basic fallacy. Yeah, so contingent, not necessary. Yeah, it, it's, um, I mean, it's a fallacy that you cover in the most basic of logic courses you can possibly imagine, right? Uh, yeah. And so it's kind of a weird, I don't know why he even kept harping on it once I mentioned that that's a fallacy, but, but it is. So uh, to give a few examples, um, um, you know, if, uh, if a cat is a carnivore, right, it's an obligate carnivore, then it is going to eat meat, yeah. right? Um, it does not follow that if you eat meat, then you are an obligate carnivore, right? So I eat meat, but I could be vegetarian. I'm an omnivore, right? I'm not like a cat. So it, it just doesn't follow, right? Or simple, you know, I mean, even simpler examples. If you are a human being, then you're a mammal. It does not follow that if you're a mammal, you have to be a human being. You can't be an elephant or a, a dog or a horse or anything, right? Um, there's lots of ways. Or, you know, if I, if I chop your head off, then you'll die. It doesn't follow that if you die... It had to be because I chopped your head off and not because you died from natural causes or something. Yeah. I mean, it's just, you know, you can come up with infinitely many of these counter examples, but the point is it's not a valid inference that, you know, from if P then Q, that if Q then P, it doesn't, doesn't work. So let, let's put the sun through that logic box because yeah, there's yeah. going to be people that, you know, are hearing right. this kind of thing for the first time. So let's put sure, churn sure. the sun through that entire logic box. Yeah. So uh, what, uh, what Jake was trying to argue was, so, Here's, now, here's, just let's just let's talk about the sun. You know, okay, let's so, put so the, the sun. Not, not Jake's saying. argument, because sure, it sure. was a 
Yeah, okay. just just the sun so through with that the lightning sun, bolt. The, the way that it would work, right, is the, the Son of God, the, the Son and the Spirit are from the Father, right? They're ab alio. So uh, the Father is ase, meaning from himself or from no one. He's the source. The Son and the Spirit have a source in the Father, right? But they're not contingent, right? They're, they're necessarily existent because they necessarily come along with the father, right? They, hmm. they come along for the ride. So just like the, the mind is fundamental, right? The idea comes from the mind hmm. and the life of, of the mind and the idea comes from the mind, right? It's all the, the mind is what's kind of the fundamental thing. And the, the logos and the spirit are from the mind. So the father, the son and the spirit are from the father, but, but they're necessarily from him, right? That's just kind of part of, part of what it is to be God. The father is, is to have a son and have a spirit or have the, the idea and the, and the life. So they necessarily exist in every conceivable world where yeah, the father exactly. exists. Yeah. They exist in every possible world and, and at every moment of time, right? Just yeah. like God, the father does. Yeah. Um, now, the 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 because the, the thing is the the analogy to Allah's body parts is yeah. identical. Yeah. Like. Yeah, that's what uh, I was trying to say. Is yeah. is he'll say that, that Allah has two hands, right? So and and there's no they're not contingent, right? There's no possible world where God lacks his hands, whatever. <laughs> Which, yeah. by the way, if you want to see an even worse debate. Go I mean, on. I think, did you see his debate with Khalil Landani? I did. I did. Yeah. And he yeah. crashed thought, and burned on that as well. <laughs> yeah, I thought, I thought Khalil really, I, I mean, I really, after that debate, I, I kind of, I have a hard time taking Jake seriously at all. I, I mean, because in my debate, he was kind of like, oh, well, they're attributes, the hands are attributes. But then he yeah. was just like, yes, God is up here. I'm like, but anyway, yeah. whatever the hands are, I mean, and also are, below his throne, and it also really below matter his what, well. how you conceive of them, right? Like if they're attributes, if they're physical hands, if there's something, I don't know what they are, but, but they're not God himself, but he has them at all times and in all possible worlds. Well, then bam, you got yourself two things that, uh, unnecessarily cool. Yeah. They're necessarily existent beings. Um, but you you don't want to say there are three ase things. Only Allah is ase, right? His hands aren't, but they're also necessary beings. So he just you know ended up. I mean, it's like the the same thing that you, you're saying is impossible for the doctrine of the Trinity. It's like totally possible for your version of Islamic philosophy. So, Doctor Bo, welcome to my Sunday life. <laughs> well, every I was single say, welcome Sunday, welcome to your world, right? Like, that is my world. That yeah. is where I yeah. live every single week. It's yeah. kind of like it's it is totally irrational for you to believe that. And then I yeah. go, well, it's you fine. have that in your religion. Yeah. Uh, another example with that, you know, the you know how can uh, how can God be encapsulated in His creation? And they've got this idea of the veil of light, which is a created thing, and yet that yeah. veil of light contains the glory of Allah. And it's like, hold on a minute. In the incarnation, you yeah. say it's impossible. But in your own yeah. attributes of Allah, you're saying it is possible. And it's like, come on, guys. That is well, you, you know, know that it, is, and if it, that is literally that is literally St. Athanasius's uh, statement about the incarnation. He says that if Christ yeah. had just kind of come into the world without taking flesh as a veil, he would incinerate the universe because of his divinity. But but he has yeah. this created veil of, of human flesh. But, but I guess that's. I guess that doesn't work, but the but the light that they, created they they have the ident they have identically that in, yeah. in, in Islam. Yeah. So I mean in terms of in terms of the the um eternal generation of the sun, yeah. Like there are there are people that 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 you know um obviously try to argue that the the sun can't be eternally generated that uh mm. it, it must be created and, and one particular argument that i have a lot is with regards to um the passage where it says and he is the firstborn of all creation mm -hmm. i forget where it is in the scriptures he's the firstborn of all creation 
um, you know, and it goes on to talk about his supremacy over all things. Mm -hmm. and, and I often look to that passage as an evidence of the eternal nature of the sun because it's outside of time. The firstborn mm -hmm. of all creation. I forget how the passage reads. I might, you know, which one that, I'm talking that actually, about. I'm that's the sure. same. Uh, that's the same verse. The the rest of it is uh, he's the the icon of the invisible the invisible God. God. That was it. Yeah. Creation. Yeah. Yeah. So like in terms of like, I think you you posited the argument um, on Orthodox Shahada that am I right in understanding that it's a necessity mm -hmm. that the, the father has a son? Yeah. Do you right. just want to do you just want to uh, expand on that argument? For, yeah. And this is part of what um, I think Jake kind of confusedly uh, I mean, he kind of poses these challenges, but I think he just kind of doesn't really listen to the answer. But, but um, yeah, the, the idea is this. So the again, the, the kind essence, uh, the Cappadocians would say, well, we don't really know what that is for God, right? It's not like we can't say like God is, you know, gold or fire or ice or, you know, like there's, there's not like something we can say this is what God's nature is because it's transcendent, right? Um, but whatever it is, they all they all share that, right? They would have the same the same nature. Um, and then you have these individual properties that is what, in, in contemporary terms, we would call it an individual essence. But it, or we'd say it's it's what identifies the same individual in different possible worlds, right? Is so it's some property that that's unique to that individual. And here's the way it works. This, the idea is that the father's individual property is fatherhood. Uh, that's what makes him the individual person with the divine nature, right? That, that he is, is, is fatherhood. And what that means, so a lot of philosophers sort of start with the intuition that, okay, God is supposed to be uncaused. So he has aseity as, as this necessary property or whatever. But the way that the way the Cappadocians say is they say, look, um, when Jesus came and talked to the disciples about God, he, he did not say he did not tell them to pray um, our uh, say monad who art in heaven. Hallowed yeah. be my name. Right. <laughs> he said our father who art in heaven. Right. So he reveals to his disciples that that we're to think of God as a father, right? That that's mm. that. And, and it's not just kind of in this froofy, like, you know, he loves us all and he's our creator, but, but, but that's fundamentally what he is, is really a father. He, he generates this son that is of the same nature, just like so that's how begetting works. Right. If, if that's so, right. If fatherhood then is his, is God's particular property, his, his hypostatic property. You can't exist in any possible world without your kind essence and without your individual essence or your hypostatic property, right? So just the fact that the father exists means there's a son because that's his hypostatic property is to, is mm. to be get a son. Mm. So that's why it's, it, there's, there's the sense in which the father is father. So there's a sense in which he's kind of more, fundamental or however you want to put it right that it, it's his personal property that is the it's not a cause and effect or a temporal sort of thing it's a logical sort of entailment right that because that's what he is he's father bam he's gonna have a son necessarily mm. every yeah. possible world every moment of time he's got this son it's also why the father is ase right it's not that ase is this special distinct thing or like jake and a lot of people do this they they want that they want aseity to be part of god's kind essence but the cappadocians would say no it's it's that fatherhood is his hypostatic property right he has the ability to cause or he does not i guess ability is not the best way to put it but he he is a cause of, of another divine person right mm -hmm. so if some if there were some other you know, God, the grandfather or whatever, there's some other being further back than God, the father that generated God, the father, that Hence would moments. be someone else having his hypostatic property, having his individual property. And yeah. that's a contradiction. 
right? This, yeah. the two people don't have, the, if it's an individual property, the whole, the whole idea is that's what uniquely identifies this individual. So two people can't have the same individual hypostatic property. So if mm. the father's hypostatic property is to generate, then no one can generate. He, he has to be ungenerated. So they would yeah. they would say aseity uh, is is a logical consequence of the fatherhood of of God, which right? is why and, it's the hypostatic property. Yeah, exactly. That's his oh, yeah. his hypostatic property, and why there's only one source, right? Because yeah, cause that's his hypostatic property is to be the source, the, the father, right? But it also means that he necessarily has a son. Hmm. Brilliant. So it's, it's, all, it's all wrapped up in in fatherhood as the hypostatic property. And people want to kind of separate begetting and being on say and all this stuff. And they would say, no, it's just it's very simple. There's one God, the father. Right. He's God and he's the father. Yeah. <laughs> and, that, and it all just it all flows from from that logic. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I can't because I think um, I, I, I want to like we've done. You know, an hour and 50 minutes now on really deep uh, discussion on the philosophy, on the on the relationship between philosophy to the doctrine or, you know, or to the, the, the portrait of scripture, the, the, of the Trinity um, and, and how these two relate and how, you know, like if philosophy, if philosophy is a map to the topography of the Trinity. And you can have varying different degrees of accuracy within your map. And just because your map might be inaccurate in places doesn't mean that you haven't got a map of the topography. Mm -hmm. It just means you haven't got a necessarily accurate or as accurate as possible map. Um, and obviously, it takes time to develop a detailed map of something. Um, so my, my question is, because obviously, a lot of the people that are going to watch this are not going to have your academic background they're not going to um you know have necessarily my inquisitiveness um about this topic um for a christian to be a christian how important is it mm -hmm. that they understand the minutiae of the doctrine yeah. of the trinity like what level of understanding <laughs> right. is necessary for a christian would you say i mean i may be extreme on on this but <laughs> I really don't think it's very important at all for you. To, I totally to agree. Yeah. Uh, uh, and I mean, it seems ironic, I guess, for me to say that as I spent so much time. But for me, it was, you know, basically when I became Orthodox, I started really kind of thinking about these things. It just, it's something that for me personally was, was something that I really felt like I needed to try to figure out for myself. But um, I don't know if I, I, I guess I'll tell this, this story. Um, uh, I'll, I'll try to tell it without without saying anything that gets me in trouble with the PC police or anything. But I I had this um, I, I visited a church one time. Um, uh, I was just traveling somewhere and I went to you know an Orthodox church um, that was near there. And, um, the I, I just had this experience that there was a I guess. I don't know if he was a deacon or just an altar server or what, but um, and I'll, I, I'll try to say this in whatever the politically correct term is nowadays, but, but he was mentally handicapped or whatever you, whatever okay. you say yeah. now. Right. So he, he was not, um, I mean, I think, I think probably he, he had down syndrome it, like, kind of from the looks of it, but anyway, he was, um, you, know, you go out and ring the bells and stuff. He's he's kind of taking part in all the the liturgy and and um, I you, you could you know sometimes you just get a sense from people that they have some there's just kind of an aura of holiness to them, mm -hmm. um, and I I kind of could could get that you know and and I remember um, the priest you know they came out and everyone took communion, and um, and this guy was. I think ringing a bell or doing some other stuff. And he kind of was, you know, late to get there in, in line. The priest was about to, you know, pack it up and go back into the altar. And he, he came out and, and, you know, the, the priest kind of looked back and, and he just was like, Oh, Oh, uh, uh. you know, like he couldn't, he didn't even have like, you know, whatever oh, yeah. level of yeah. you know, verbal ability to say, 
articulately what he what he wanted and the priest was just kind of oh did you not did you not take communion here do you need you know and and it just it really struck me that like you know I mean, here, here's a guy who is at that level, you know, verbally and mentally or whatever. Um, mm-hmm. But spiritually, I I could tell far above me. I mean, and, mm-hmm. and I kind of have thought since then, like, you know, like, would I trade, like, would I trade places with, with him? I mean, like, I, you know, I, I, cause I sometimes you know, get, get really hung up in all of this kind of philosophy and whatever. And it's something that's, but it's like, but spiritually this guy is way, yeah, you know, way further than, than me. Uh, and it, but it, but one thing it certainly, you know, solidified in me was the idea that like, I, this isn't, you know, th- this isn't your, your path to heaven. Um, yeah. Knowing all the minutia of dogma is not, um, you know that's not that's not gonna gonna make your your uh it's it's not gonna be what's gonna save your soul you know at the at the final judgment yeah so i i wouldn't uh i i wouldn't say that that people need to feel like they need to understand every little detail of of the faith i, I think there's much more um i mean much more concretely god wants you to obey his his commandments. Uh, mm. He wants you to love him. He wants you to love your your neighbor. Um, and I, you know, I think, like you were saying earlier, a lot of times people get hung up on these like internet debates about theology. And I always kind of think, is this spiritually edifying you? Mm. You know, like is this re- is this and is this going to help me? Like, am I going to get closer to God by debating the the details of how we use a certain term or something like this or yeah i i don't i don't think i i don't think it's something that you it, it reminds it reminds me of the passage in scripture which for me as an apologist and a polemicist mm-hmm. is very important to me always to remember which is that knowledge puffs up but love builds up yeah yeah exactly because i think sometimes you know people they you know they see me yeah. have these debates and i pull out these factoids and you know like bits yeah. of information and it's like, oh he's so clever and they miss and they equate cleverness with holiness and they're not the yeah, same thing at all yeah it's not it's definitely it's not, not. It's de- definitely I, not actually whole. i was gonna i was thinking about this earlier when you were talking about heresy and maps and things and there's a great um line in the desert fathers there's a story in the desert fathers where um one of these desert fathers comes and he he's there's a whole group of of other monks there you know and he gets a verse out of the bible and he asks each of them what's the way to interpret it what's the correct interpretation of this? and it said he started with the youngest and you know kind of went up the line and and everyone would give their interpretation or their opinion and he would say no that's not that's not the right interpretation and finally he got to i think it's abba joseph or something he was this old man who's very renowned for his holiness and whatever and he asked him, you know, what's the interpretation of this verse? And he just said, I don't know. I don't understand it. And the the other father turned around and he said, uh, only Abba Joseph has found the way because he said he, that I don't know. Hmm. So, you know, he was the only one who would just admit. <laughs> I just don't yeah. know what the, the yeah. word means. He's, he's the only one who had the humility to say, like, I, I don't know how to interpret it. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And and I and I think I think it's it's important to to keep these things in their right perspective. Knowledge is a good thing and having yeah. lots of knowledge is, is a better thing, but it, it but it's not the same as holiness. And it, it yeah, you know, really. it's not as important as holiness in our lives. Um Dr. Bo, I, I wanna say thank you so much for thank um, you. taking this time. You. I've really loved it. I, I I loved it last time. I've loved it even more this time. Um, I hope you've enjoyed it as well. Um, as your final parting gift, if you if you could suggest to me who you think I should have on my YouTube channel to talk to, um, oh. who, who would you want? Who would you want to see me have on and talk to? Oh, um, gosh, I i just recommended a while back a friend of mine scott williams who um he's the one that uh he kind of discovered this like trinitarian theology in the sixth ecumenical council um 
I don't know. Sorry, my my cat's being naughty, but um, yeah. I don't know if he exactly fits in with what uh, what you're doing or not. But uh, but uh, he you'd, you'd say him. But yeah, but he's he has interesting uh, things to to say about the sixth like medical council. Well, maybe if you maybe if you post this to him and tell him to look at these last few minutes of it, I'll um yeah I'll leave an open invite to him and I'll I'll try and reach out to him to have him on to talk about that very thing. Cool, Doctor Bo, thank you very much for your enlightening conversation um, this evening. I've learned a lot. I'm sure other people will learn a lot as well. And it's been great to catch up with you again. Let's do better than every two years, I hope. Yeah, I was going to say, I think I missed uh, an email or two from you. And so I'll, I'll try to respond more quickly next time. So. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. God bless yeah. and Thank peace you. be with you. So, guys, if you like that uh, program and you want to support the work that I'm doing, uh, all the necessary links are in the description box below. Uh, Please do so prayerfully. Don't feel under any pressure um, and every little helps. Okay. God bless and good night.